the blogger behind No Longer Quivering, the former fundamentalist who has seen the light of reason. And by the way, uh, keep the applause going for Vicky because just last night she was awarded American Atheist, Atheist of the Year 2014. Showing a lot of people that there can be and that there is a way out of, is it fair to say the dark ages? I guess the dark ages is pretty much what, what, you're, what you had been living in. Well, um, we're good? Okay, well, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, here she is, my friend and uh, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations once again, Vicki. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I do not feel a lot of pressure to deliver the most amazing speech. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because after they gave me this award last night, I talked to Hina Dadaboy and I said, I kind of feel like I need to go back to my room and spend the whole night rewriting my speech to make it atheist of the year worthy. And if, you ever, if you're a woman and you're having some, some self-confidence um, issues there, Tina's the one to talk to. You talk to that woman and she said to me, she said, Vicki, they already made you atheist of the year, so whatever you want to say is atheist of the year material. <laughs> So thank you for that, Nina. <laughs> I, I needed that encouragement. <laughs> okay, hopefully I can get this down. So my talk, which I have titled Fertile Ground, is my attempt to answer one of the most frequently asked questions that no longer quivering. And the question comes in many different forms, usually something like, are you Catholic? Or haven't you figured out what causes that? Or uh, don't you have any hobbies? Are you nuts? And so basically, well, the question, what people want to know is, how in the world did you end up with so many kids? And I need this to work. Is it not working? forward. Maybe I can just use the keys. Yeah. All right. This isn't working, but this works, so I'm good. So I have a little confession to make, and that is that I never wanted any kids. Um, <laughs> for as long as I can remember, I knew that parenting was not for me. And when I was 12 years old, I came up with what seemed to me a foolproof plan to avoid pregnancy for my entire life. I would uh, devote myself to God, become a Catholic nun, and live in a convent. Not because I was raised in a Christian home or knew anything about the Catholic Church, but I had heard that vir uh, nuns remain virgins, and that sounded like a surefire way to never be a mother. So sign me up for that. <laughs> and when asked how I could know for certain that I didn't want any kids ever, I had a pretty impressive list of reasons, very good reasons, why I uh, didn't want to. And one of them, you know, including being an intro introvert um, and not wanting to be responsible for messing up the childhood of another human being. Plus, I have a genetic bone condition which causes chronic pain and is debilitating. I didn't know it back then, but complications from that condition makes it so that it, pregnancy is literally a life-threatening condition for me. What I did know was that multiple hereditary exostosis is an autosomal dominant disease, which meant that if I ever did get pregnant, uh, there was a 50-50 chance that my children would inherit my bubby bone condition. So I didn't want any kids, and now I have seven children. 
Um, obviously, the details of what happened makes for a very long story, but today I just want to focus on the so-called pro-life rhetoric and the biblical family values that cultivate what I like to call fertile ground for the Quiverful Movement, which derailed my otherwise solid life plan to enjoy the bliss of childlessness. Is it too loud? It sounds really, I sound so loud. Okay. <laughs> but before I get started, I just want to say that I have really awesome kids. They are terrific people. They're full of life, full of love. Um, and each and every one of them holds a huge chunk of my heart. Uh, they have enriched my life, and I do not in any way regret having seven children. And I will have more to say about the blessing of children later on. So let's start with purity culture. Even though I was raised in a Christian home, I still managed to not, I was not raised in a Christian home, I still managed to pick up on the idea and internalize the message that my value as a girl was derived from my virginity. So when I had sex with my boyfriend at age 15, I knew that I was spoiled for all other guys. I was basically a good kid. I got along well with family and friends. I worked responsible, responsibly at the local A&W restaurant. I stayed out of trouble. My grades in school were so high that my guidance counselor advised me to apply for a full scholarship at the University of Nevada, Reno. And despite all of these positives, um, I knew that God was disappointed in me because I wasn't a virgin. I had really blown it. So much for my carefully considered life plan. I wasn't going to be able to come and become a nun now. And uh, so two weeks after I turned 16, I married Brian. Not because I loved him, but because I was afraid to tell him no. I was afraid that he might react violently, but I was more deeply afraid that any other guy would see me as used goods. Within weeks, Brian pressured me to drop out of high school. He had already dropped out, and he was so insecure and jealous and controlling that he could not stand to have me out of his sight for six hours a day. Um, he didn't want me to quit my job because we needed the money, but during my shift, he would sit out in the lobby and watch to make sure that I didn't get too friendly with the male customers. So purity is a lucrative niche in the Christian product marketing. They have everything from books and purity rings, purity balls, true love weights merchandise, and I'm calling purity the soil in the fertile ground of Quiverful. And I do realize that my graphic looks like a big pile of manure. <laughs> and actually, that is fairly accurate. <laughs> so who besides me cringes at the phrase Proverbs 31 woman? Yeah. Fast forward a few years, and I'm sure no one will be surprised to learn that our marriage was not working out. Uh, we'd been through a lot together, including juvenile detention, homelessness, petty theft, uh, getting shot at by the guy who stole the stuff that we had stolen, uh, Job Corps, numerous jobs and several apartments. I desperately wanted our relationship to work, but Brian was getting more and more angry and resentful. When he made me stand perfectly still while he practices nunchucks, and he would swing them as fast and as hard as he could over my head or just alongside my head. He'd hold on to one stick and snap the other like within an inch of my nose. And if I blinked, that was proof that I didn't trust him. Well, that's when I got really serious about finding Jesus and living for him in the hopes that he would save me and my marriage. I found a Word of Life Christian fellowship that offered free rides to church. There I learned from the Bible study ladies that if I wanted a solid, godly marriage, I had to learn to submit to my husband, to anticipate and meet his every need, and never give him cause for complaint. And if I did all that, the Lord would work in Brian's heart and transform him into a loving, godly Christian husband. 
So when I did my, what most people would consider an admirable job of being a virtuous wife, rather than repenting of his sins and joining me in Christian devotion, Brian got a girlfriend. I, w I was devastated <laughs> and frankly really pissed off at God uh, for not coming through for me despite my earnest passion and my near-perfect faithfulness. Like, where was he? Stuck in toast. <laughs> so I'm going to say that the Christian teachings on the Proverbs 31 woman till the soil to prepare evangelical women to be fertile ground for Christian fundamentalism. And by the way, biblical womanhood happens to be a very lucrative department in resources for Christian living. So now let's talk about crisis pregnancy centers. In my hurt and confusion, I turned to com for comfort to a neighbor's friend who had showed an interest in me. Skip was a 37-year-old unemployed veteran from the Vietnam War. Um, he suffered from PTSD and he lived with his mother. Uh, he told me that he had had a vasectomy so that I wouldn't make him use a condom. I went to a crisis pregnancy center for a free pregnancy test, and while I was waiting for the results, the volunteers made me watch the silent scream. From that 40 minutes inside the CPC, I learned that my baby was already fully formed with brain waves and a beating heart, and God had a very special plan for my baby's life, and he promised to take care of me, plus they would give me free diapers. So despite severe depression, which had led me to starve myself down to 69 pounds, when the OBGYN told me at my first prenatal appointment, you should not be pregnant, abortion was out of the question. As much as I did not want to be pregnant, did not want to be a mother, did not want any of this, and had no idea how I was going to take care of a little baby, uh, when the doctor stood perfectly quiet, providing an opportunity for me to consider my options, it was too late. They had already gotten inside my head. So while thoughts of burning in hell for eternity silenced my brain, and images of dismembered baby parts constrained my flight, fight or flight instincts, I chose life. So let's call crisis pregnancy centers the fertilizer, a very heavy bag of horseshit. <laughs> hey, and are you starting to recognize a pattern here? So since I was going to be a mom, I decided I'd better get my act together for my baby's sake. And so I went back to Brian, whom I believed was the father of my baby. And I also went back to church and determined to be the very best Christian wife possible. On the night of our fifth wedding anniversary, Brian took acid, and he kept me up all night with a loaded shotgun aimed at my head. He was so pissed at me for ruining his life, and he told me over and over that he wished he had the courage to pull the trigger. And just before sunrise, the exhaustion and the confusion and the desperation and fear overcame me. And I told my husband that I honestly wished that he had the courage to just get it over with. I'd been praying silently this whole time. And so I praised God when instead of putting a bullet through my head like he wanted to, Brian passed out. And I made my escape to the Midwest for a fresh start on life for me and my year-old baby girl. I was convinced that living wholeheartedly for Jesus was the key to providing a stable, happy home and a better life for my child. And I believed that I could discover God's will for my life in the pages of the Bible. I often listen to Christian family radio talk shows like Focus on the Family, Family Life Today, uh, Gateway to Joy, Revive Our Hearts, um, American Family Radio. <laughs> And from these programs, I learned that traditional families are the best, and fathers are extremely important. 
And it wasn't long before I met and married a good Christian man who was just as serious about living biblically as I was. He was great with kids, and he had a good heart, and he may have had some not-so-great tendencies towards obsession and controlling, um, but when I prayed and I asked the Lord for guidance, Jesus gave me peace in my heart. And so I trusted that God knew best and that he would work all things together for good. And yes, I did buy a lot of books. Okay, there are a couple of uh, elements in contemporary Christianity which are key to the cultivation of fertile ground for the fundamentalist extremism, which really do need to be addressed. But I don't have a lot of time to go into it in depth to explain how these things actually played out in my own life. But real quick, uh, one of these days, I want to devote an entire presentation to the topic of Christian martyrdom and the idea of dying to self. But today I'm going to spend about two minutes on the topic. In my 25 years as a born-again Christian, I certainly didn't miss the fact that the central message of Christianity is martyrdom. God sacrifices his only son, Jesus willingly submits to torture and death, and believers are admonished to follow his example. Crucify the flesh, take up your cross and follow me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. I am not my own, I've been bought with a price, uh, and so on. So this idea of dying to self is so prevalent it infects the minds of Christians, and eventually they develop this huge martyr complex. <laughs> what I love is like everything I wanted to say about Christianity, there's a meme for it. <laughs> Yay, internet. And just because I'm rushing through this section, please do not go away with the impression that the emphasis on crucifixion and death plays only a minor role in cultivating Christian fundamentalism. Christians are so fixated on martyr martyrdom, and they strongly identify with Jesus' crucifixion. And this leads to another complex, the persecution complex. Martyrdom and persecution are two big boogeymen which cause Christians to shed great buckets of tears which water the seeds in the fertile ground of fundamentalism. So, Bible prophecy. Uh, predictions of doomsday, end time, apocalyptic paranoia are like the heat of the sun that in my little fertile ground theme here. And this is serious business, which truly terrifies Bible believers. So scary, in fact, that when we learn that Bill Clinton who was most likely the Antichrist, had won the presidency, fear for our children's future compelled us to take the final step, which landed us in full-fledged fundamentalist Christian extremistville. So purity culture, crisis pregnancy centers, pro-life rhetoric, biblical family values, the martyrdom, the persecution, and Bible prophecy all help to cultivate the fundamentalism which is quiverful. But let me tell you where patriarchy and prolific motherhood really flourishes, and that is in Christian homeschooling. And of course, not every homeschooler, not every family in homeschools is religiously motivated. But within Christian homeschool community, biblical family values is being aggressively marketed as an investment to safeguard our loved ones from becoming collateral damage in today's culture war against the family. As always, there's money in war. So here's a picture from the Christian Homeschooling Convention Curriculum Fair in Texas, which I found on a website of a quiverful family that sells creation science materials to other Christian homeschool homeschoolers. And the caption beneath the sign in the vendor hall says, cooperate with me. The caption beneath the sign in the vendor hall read, 
Needless to say, we spent a great amount of, of money at that hall. But this is the price of tuition for a homeschool family, is an investment in our son's education and character. There is big money to be had in selling family stability and security to desperate moms and dads who've come to Christianity as refugees from dysfunctional homes, and parents who are confused and scared for the future, and they're looking for answers as they scramble to raise their children in a healthier environment than that which they themselves had experienced as kids. So when you go to a Christian homeschool co conference, you will find uh, curriculum companies selling math books, creation science materials, the revisionist history, of course. And you can pick up spelling or penmanship workbooks. But the booths where you're going to find the majority um, of the attendees are gathering and where they're taking out their checkbooks and they are making the purchases. These are with the vendors who are selling a lifestyle. And they are peddling a vision of a big, happy, godly family. Also in these Christian homeschool conventions, there will be workshops about topics that, you know, that teach how, how to teach advanced math to high schoolers um, or other academic focused topics. And there will be a few parents that are in there listening, but the workshops that are crowded, where the parents are paying attention and they're taking notes, the most popular speakers are talking about family life and not just you know, making brothers and sisters best friends, but they're talking about topics like courtship versus betrothal, um, the value of motherhood, and okay, these are actual titles from these workshops. How a wife can use reverence to build or save her marriage. Why Satan wants your firstborn. Um, honor the secret ingredient of family life. So, it wasn't until we began homeschooling that I encountered full-blown quiverful through books such as Mary Pride's The Way Home, Beyond Feminism and Back to Reality, or Nancy Campbell's God's Plan for Families. Quiverful leaders are masters at spin, and playing on a woman's sincere desire to serve the Lord wholeheartedly, they use the scriptures to convince a woman that she wants nothing more than to stay at home have lots of babies, and serve her husband, even if these choices might cost her everything. By this point, she has internalized the ideas of sacrifice and martyrdom so completely that she is determined to die to herself, her dreams, her interests, even her own sanity, in order to fulfill the role for which she believes God created her, to be a helpmate to her husband, a fruitful vine, birthing many arrows for God's holy war. And while the quiverful woman will insist that this lifestyle is her choice, in truth, she has no choice. When I was fully enthralled to, quiverful, to the quiverful head trip, there was no choice at all. Of course, I would welcome all the blessings that the Lord wanted to place in my womb. Of course, um, I would risk my life. Why would I choose barrenness, the curse of God? Why would I deny life itself to another person merely because of the inconvenience to me? How could I consider my own health when we're talking about a baby, a tiny human with potential for you know, eternal life in heaven? A woman's choice was anathema to me because I believed that I was not my own. I had been bought with a price, the blood of Christ. And in the same way that the fundamentalist Christian God allows people to exercise their free will by choosing between worshiping and serving him or else burning in hell forever, the quiverful woman must make the decision to trust God and perhaps die physically or trust in the pill and her own common sense and die spiritually for all eternity. That is not a choice. That's an ultimatum. The pro-life faithful will hear my story and say that God has provided, that he used my children to make me a better person, 
That was my personal narrative for over half of my life. But now I say, bull frickin' shit. I refuse to give glory and all the credit to the big guy for my semi-success as a mega mom with seven kids who are mostly happy and healthy and well-adjusted and only occasionally feel like disowning me. I credit my children, uh, their strength and intelligence and their resilience have enabled them to flourish despite my shortcomings. And I credit myself for being resourceful and determined to make the best of a life that I did not want. But no thanks to Jesus because I now realize that he is the one who created the potentially disastrous situation which I so desperately needed him to save me from. And let me be clear, I no longer believe in Jesus or any other personal deity. So when I say he, I mean the believers and purveyors of Christian pro-life culture, which influenced me to choose exactly the opposite of what I instinctively knew was my um, own best interest. You see, the Christian right doesn't even need to pass their contraception denying or abortion restricting legislation in order to limit women's reproductive choices. The twisted patriarchal ideals that underlie such legislation have permeated our society to such an extent that it's not actually necessary to outlaw birth control and abortion in order to convince women that they don't dare aspire to any other life other than submissive baby makers. Quiverful is pro-life, standard pro-life rhetoric, full grown. And as much as, as these families involved convince themselves that Quiverful is a personal conviction which the Lord has personally uh, revealed to them through diligent Bible study and prayer, the truth is biblical family values is a niche market and its profitability ensures that more and more evangelical Christian families will be scammed by opportunistic peddlers of the culture wars. So I spent over a quarter of a century fighting. <laughs> Thank you. I spent over a quarter century fighting with all my might in this war that was mostly all in my head, but no more. And here's the part that's so annoying. The enemy, the world, which for so many years I had feared and shunned, and it's turned out to be mostly a paper tiger. And in most cases, not just harmless, but even benevolent and beneficial. <laughs> and the same thing goes for just about everything which my fundamentalist quiverful beliefs made me guard my family against. Um, television, secular music, public school, peer pressure, convenience foods, teen rebellion, um, boy-girl dating relationships, fashionable clothing, feminist values, social workers, professional counselors, youth groups, and even the really big spooks, homosexuals and atheists. Yeah. <laughs> True story, last night I hung out with, the, with some atheists at a gay bar. And it was a blast. <laughs> A friend recently put it this way, it's like buying insurance to protect you from the boogeyman under the bed. It's childish, unnecessary, a waste of time and money. So not everyone who reads it no longer quivering becomes an atheist, but because Quiverful is such a comprehensive worldview, a large percentage of those who do see the light eventually just abandon the faith altogether. And you might think that such a deep delusion, which has been cultivated and carefully nurtured for years, would take a massive amount of deprogramming. But in my experience with Christian fundamentalist women, it only takes a little bit of focusing. And when you see it, you do get a little mad 
and even sometimes totally pissed when we realize that we have been scammed, sold a bill of goods. But we can't just stop there with our anger because we have a quiver full of kids that we have to rescue from the mess of fundamentalism. Um, and you can read our stories at No Longer Quivering. Um, when I got this award last night, I was so stunned that I was speechless. I didn't know what to say. That, and I'm, I'm still stunned, but I, I have something I want to say. Because in 2003, we were named as the Nebraska Family of the Year by the Nebraska Family Council. And for those who don't immediately understand what that means, um, you've heard a focus on the family, uh, Family Research Council and Tony Perkins, that hate group. Um, Nebraska Family Council is the local affiliate, and they awarded us as Family of the Year because of our, um, you know, our work in promoting these pro-life biblical family values and in helping to get the um, D DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, passed in Nebraska. And I remember that night, uh, you know, we knew we were getting the award. We had to go to Lincoln, and when, when Ben Nelson called us up to the podium, and I was like hugely pregnant with my seventh baby. And I got my husband with me and all these kids, and we got up there, and I just, it just came to me. I thought, you know, what if somebody would have just hit the pause button and then flashed me this <laughs> scene? I'd have been like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Don't let that happen to me. But from there to here, I'm just going to say, I've come a long fucking way, baby. Your 2014 American Atheist, Atheist of the Year, Vicki Garrison. Yeah, I meant to do that. 